right, welcome everyone. Without further ado, we have a great program for you today, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. We are happy to be with you for this live stream presentation from Museum of the Rockies and Streamable Learning. I don't know about you, but I am super excited to hear from Ellen Lamb today. She is Museum of the Rockies Paleocristology Lab Manager, and she gets to look inside dinosaur bones for her job. So we're going to find out more about what that really looks like and what that tells us. Ellen, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, hey everybody. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, am I on? I'm good. You're on. I'm on. Okay, great. I'm going to actually, um, let's see, I'll just stop, stop the share for a second and go to speaker view. All right. So welcome everybody, I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm gonna go back and forth a few times between my PowerPoint presentation and my kitchen. <laughs> so I just wanted to say hello fully and then we'll go back and practice the technology of the screen share. All right. One thing I forgot to mention while Ellen's getting that loaded, if you have any questions for us today, I'm sure you're super familiar with Zoom at this point, go ahead and type those into the Q&A box. If you're answering questions that we have for you, go ahead and type them in the chat box. We'll do our best to answer everything we can. We may not get to all of them, so you might have some homework when we're done on Googling those yourself. All right. Okay, so I'm going to check here that we've got sound and screen share. All right, so today we're going to study paleohistology, which is the study of microscopic structure of fossil specimens. And that's going to be the focus of today. And we're actually going to zoom out and zoom in and zoom out and zoom in while we're on Zoom together, I'm looking at geological time. We're gonna talk about change over time and how it happens um, in the earth and how it happens um, in an, all the way down to how it happens in an individual. Um, we're gonna look at change over time in the fossil record. So um, we're gonna look at that concept in a variety of ways and ultimately understand how we use paleohistology, looking inside of the dinosaur bones to help us fit fossils into that fossil record over time. So I'm working here to move my advance. All right, so um, change over time again, geological time on earth is where we're going to start and then we're going to end up actually inside of a fossil and then we're going to zoom back out <laughs> from inside of the fossil and go all the way back through geological time. All right, so this is Big Mike and at the front of the Museum of the Rockies greeting us right now. This is what it's looking like. We've got our apple trees and some plants beautifully in bloom and we're getting ready to open soon to the public. So that's gonna be a really exciting, exciting moment and a really, um, a really important transition at this time. So hopefully if you're here locally, you'll be able to visit with us. Museum of the Rockies is located in hey, Bozeman. Ellen, Ellen, sorry to interrupt you there. This is Elliot. Okay. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to let you know, we're having some issues seeing your screen. It looks like the internet connection is a little bit slow right now. So I think we're okay. frozen on your title screen. Can you do me a favor and hit stop share? Okay. And then, um, yeah, reshare, but select the PowerPoint directly from that share list instead of your whole desktop should be one of the options that pops up. Beginning again. Yeah, and you guys disappeared too. And last time I could see you while I was talking and myself, which was helpful. Okay, so we're gonna screen share. We're gonna go to PowerPoint. All right, there you are. Okay, so this should probably be better. So let's... Go back in time. Speaking of zooming through time. <laughs> All right, so now we, I'm at um, 
the initial slide of my presentation. And now moving to the second slide, is it moving on your end? Yes, yeah, so it looks great. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me all right, audio wise? Yes, audio is great. Okay, okay. excellent. All right, so again, we'll review very quickly. Paleo has studied, hey, let me start again. Paleohistology is the study of the microscopic structure of fossil specimens, and that'll be our focus today. And that's the zooming that we discussed. And there is Big Mike. So I think where, what I was telling you is the location of Museum of the Rockies is here in Bozeman, Montana, just north of Yellowstone Park and south of the Canadian border. It sounded like we might have a Canadian um, student on today, so that's exciting. Welcome. And here's a little bit closer look at the location of Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. So I'm going to ask you on the next slide to let me know, and you can put it in the chat box if um, anyone who is joined joining us today has been to the Museum of the Rockies. And hopefully, if you come through Bozeman, you'll be able to visit. And if you're here in Bozeman- Hey, Ellen, this is Elliot again. Sorry to interrupt you. So you're frozen again. I think what we're gonna have to do is have you leave and then rejoin, if you don't mind. And I think okay. that will solve the issue. Okay, sorry everybody for the tech yep. issues. We'll, we'll hang tight of... right here and we'll pick right back up. Okay, so I'm going to go down and escape and sharing. Okay, I'm going to leave and I will follow the process to rejoin. Okay, guys, I'll okay, see you in great. a little bit. Thank you. See you in a second. Thanks for your patience, everyone. We'll get her back here shortly. Thanks, Elliot, for your help. Okay. Perfect. You're back and clear. Okay, great. And I have five bars on my machine, so hopefully that is going to work. All right. And I'll set share computer sound. So all you guys are getting to learn how all of this Zoom works as well, although you're probably well versed <laughs> on the technology. By now, let's see. Um, play from current slide. How's that look, guys? That looks great. Thumbs up. Sound is excellent, okay. too. Okay, so excellent. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it all looks great. So, right away, I'm just going to extend a sound. Excellent. Okay, okay, so we'll <laughs> the third time will be the charm. Okay, so I want to extend a thank you to our Museum of the Rockies paleontology, paleontology curators of past and of present, Jack Horner and our current curator, John Scanella. And I want to thank visiting researchers and I want to thank my colleagues at the MOR. The, the work of our histology lab is driven by the research and the investi investigations of many people locally and then many people around the world. So I think it's really important to just extend a thanks to them. So we have visiting researchers and both Holly and Carrie have also done um, work with streamable learning and you can go on the Museum of the Rockies website and listen to their presentations. And then here are some other colleagues who have done um, recent streamable broadcasts. And what I would love to know from our group who's here today, uh, 
who has seen some of these other streamables? Um, Scott Williams, Amy Atwater, Richard Carr, John Scanella. It'll be helpful for me to know because they covered a lot of the topics um, that surround the topic of paleohistology. Um, and if you've seen those, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today will make more sense. And then John and I did a paleohistology streamable in 2018. And it's on the museum um, website under the videos in paleo if you scroll all the way down. And you'll be able to see um, and learn more about a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, but you're gonna get to see us in the lab with actual fossil material. So is my friend Dakota still out there? <laughs> this is her first one. Um, we have a couple people who've seen Scott and John and Amy. Okay, excellent, excellent, because they covered some of the geology, some ideas about the fossil record, um, lots of things about uh, preservation, evolution of animals. So we're gonna touch on all of that lightly, but they go into it with more depth. So my dear friend Dakota, her and I um, became friends while figure skating. And uh, she sent me something that she wrote this week about Rosalind Franklin. And there was a quote in there, science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. And I loved that quote. I thought, wow, that's very much how I have lived my life. <laughs> and not being able to access the specimens at the museum, I just started walking around my own house and gathering up specimens and realized that yes, science and everyday life are not separated here because I had all sorts of wonderful um, modern bone material and um, to share and show you today. So I'm gonna segue to that. And if you want, you can also research Rosalind Franklin. Her work was instrumental in our understanding of the structure of DNA. So I'm going to stop the share and come back to you in full and what i have down here is a collection of materials and i just wanted to give you a quick glimpse but i'm going to look at our time so i won't take too much time to do it um, of the kinds of things i had around my house um, so if anybody wants to make a guess on what these are we were just talking about these at the start of the show. So there's a small set, and then I'm gonna go over here. The second set I borrowed from a neighbor. <laughs> and these are pretty magnificent. I've got two of them down here. So if you guys want to chat in some, some guesses what animals these might have come from, and I wanted to highlight the feature that they are um, the, some of the very fastest bone tissue uh, growing on the planet. We've got and, some food cookies out there. They're telling us they're from deer and elk, Ellen. Excellent. You've got it. <laughs> this is from a mule deer, and the other ones were from elk. And then I wanted to show you some other bone and these two pieces are just interesting they're both modern bone although when i first found this bone i thought it was a fossil um, but i had found it um, with, coming out of a stream it had actually been buried in the mud next to a stream and then this is a more standard color and standard uh, looking bone so if you want to give some ideas of how did this get so dark and change color um, and end up looking like a fossil, even though it's still a modern bone. All right. Um, we've got some guesses of erosion. The wider one might be a throat bone. Hmm. Um, my chat box just went away. <laughs> um, maybe it was in mud. 
right? It was in mud, right? So the minerals in the soil, as water and pressure and time have their effect on bone, bone will actually absorb those minerals and change color. And through the process of fossilization, the actual um, minerals in the bone are replaced by the minerals that are in the soil and moving through it, um, again, with water and pressure and time. So um, this gives you a little idea about me um, <laughs> and the lack of separation of science and life. This is my dad. He's a re he was a research scientist and he used to sneak me into his laboratory. And this is me at 10, uh, maybe eight or nine years old. And this is when I got my very first microscope. And it was one very similar to this one here. <laughs> So I wondered, um, have anybody, has anyone today ever looked through a microscope? And then these are other things I did. Here I was, this was a place we used to go dig for rocks and crystals, and here I am camping. <laughs> so I just want to give you a little flash of what I was like when I was similar to your age. Collecting things, very interested in everything, very curious about how things worked, and I brought a lot of things home, both living and dead. <laughs> much to my mother's dismay. Today we're going to talk about the concept of ontogeny. And I'm going to use that word a lot, and that is the individual maturation or development. Um, we study that at Museum of the Rockies quite a lot. And I, here is an ontogenetic series of my daughter. <laughs> and also I wanted to let you know a little bit about her. Here she is on her very first dinosaur dig at Egg Mountain. Can you see the arrow and the pointer as I'm circling on the screen? Is that showing up for you? Okay. Yep. Here she is. Um, here is Rebecca. When Big Mike was actually being put up in 1991, you can see a little ladder there um, right here. So they were actually mounting Big Mike at that time. And then here she is um, coming back for Christmas um, from college. And she's in Brooklyn, New York, and she's graduating tomorrow, guys, from Pratt Institute. So I'm very proud of her, but I thought this would be also a nice example you guys could relate to. That's what ontogeny is, developing and maturing of an individual, the study of that. So I talked to you already about how we're going to zoom out to in. And then quickly, another great quote. I found this this morning. One of our research scientists in the Earth Sciences Department here at MSU, I didn't mention we're part of Montana State University. If you're looking for a great school to study Earth Sciences, including paleontology, it's a wonderful place. And she say, said rocks actually record the history of Earth. They tell us where life when life came about with a fossil record and when mountains were being built versus when they were being eroded. And there's a great story about her at the MSU um, webpage today, the lead story. She just was awarded a very large grant to study plate tectonics and uh, deep time on Earth. So I just thought I would share that because it well explains the next two slides. Um, some of the other streamable presenters in paleontology have talked to you about geological change over time. So this is showing the ages and stages and the history of Earth as recorded in the rocks over very large spans of time, millions of years. Beautiful art by Ray Troll. And this side of his wonderful illustration is showing evolutionary change. The changes in life forms on Earth as animals developed and evolved and went extinct. So we're back to ontogeny, now with dinosaurs. Here's a great example, another beautiful art by Doug Henderson. Paleo artists are very, very important to what we do as well. And here's the mother Myasaura and all of her little babies in the nest. So this is an animal that we've studied extensively. Okay, so a question for you guys to think about. We're gonna talk a lot about bones and the skeletal system. It is one of many systems in the body. So I love this picture of this dinosaur because you can look inside. It actually is a, a puzzle that you can put together. 
And I want you to be thinking about um, what other body systems there are. Like an example we're hearing a lot about right now is the respiratory system. So dinosaurs had all of those systems too. Um, so give that some thought as I move ahead. Um, today, of course, our focus is on the skeletal system. Some of you may have broken a bone in your life and had to have a cast and, and hopefully everything healed back perfectly. So the bones will um, right now be recording um, your growth and your development and will have the life history of you inside of them. So this is um, a little peek into our dinosaurs um, in the Big Sky exhibit. And in there, we have this group of dinosaur limb bones. And it's, again, a very, very good example of ontogeny. So can you make a guess what these bones might be showing? We've got a very small one down here. This is from Myasaura up to a very large one here. And this is the upper leg bone. And if some of you want to think about the limb bones, the other thing we look at a lot in dinosaurs in regards to their bones are how their skulls change. They can change and transform dramatically through the dinosaur's lifetime. Um, sometimes confusing researchers if they've got um, a young animal or a juvenile or a subadult or an adult um, of the same animal because they all look so different. So now I'm gonna show you, so we saw how those leg bones changed over time. Now I'm gonna show you how these skulls can change over time. So this is a young animal. And as you go to your right, it's maturing and then getting older. So what I want you to pay attention to is the horns. So can you see what's happening to the horns over time? So that's some, another, some other questions for you to think about. And then to bring it back home, <laughs> um, at the ages that you're out right now, you may be having some radical changes happening in your very own skull. So if you want to type in answers to any of those questions, tell us what you think about those legs, tell us what you think um, is happening in the changes in those horns, and also for you, do you have something major going on within your own skull right now? Lots so I'm gonna flip. Okay, let's hear some answers. Lots of great observations. The horns are starting to move and curve forward or backward. They're growing mm -hmm. longer. Um, there's a mm -hmm. long, great list. So thank you everyone for typing in. The, the frills Excellent. are getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good observations. Yes. And John Scanella um, elaborates on what's going on there in the development of the Triceratops in some of his talks. So um, along with bone, we also look at different tissue types. And I'm going to go through these really quickly just so you get a, a first view with them. So we have fossilized bone. We look at ossified tendon. We look at eggshell. We look at teeth. And histology can reveal a whole variety of things. Just as sampling would be, as we talked about, the stage of growth or the chronological age of an animal. Um, what was its health? Did it have an injury it was healing from? Was it, um, are there evidence of a disease condition that the dinosaur had that is, remains in its bones? Um, we can look at uh, different questions around reproduction. There's a certain tissue type which lets us know we have a female dinosaur. We can actually study incubation time using histology to figure out how long a dinosaur was in an egg, if we're fortunate enough to find an embryo. Uh, we can look at behavior, asking that question, did they use, Ant, right? We looked, we know what deer and elk do with their antlers, sort of a variety of things, um, but, with dinosaurs, with all of the elaborate ornamentation on their heads, were they used for um, defense? Were they used for display or a combination there? 
And then um, the family structure is something that I find most exciting when you can sleuth out actual dinosaur behavior, ideas like nesting and parental care and did dinosaurs burrow um, and live together in family groups and burrows as well. So these are the kinds of questions histology can reveal. Today we're going to just look at just bone out of those different tissue types and then we're going to look at the question about that stage of growth or the chronological age of the animal just so we can hone in because <laughs> it can be very very broad so the techniques how do we get inside of a dinosaur bone so right here we have a variety of techniques of what we need to do before we begin and then what we need to do once we actually have our specimen so I'm going to, um, in a moment, play this video and you can see me actually cutting up a dinosaur bone. However, before you get to this point, um, you need to plan your project uh, around, based on your research, research question or your hypothesis. And you need to definitely um, hone in on what specimens you want to examine and then get proper permission to do this work before you begin. And also before actually cutting open a precious fossil, um, which they're rare and essentially irreplaceable, we want to plan how we're going to put it all back together when we finish. So other researchers in the future can study the intact bone. So let's play this video so you can... you notice my safety gear, a big face shield on. So I'm actually cutting into a dinosaur bone and I'm going to extract out a piece. At the end of that cut, I'm working on a tile saw that has a special diamond edge blade. So I make a very, very thin slice through the, through the bone. I'm going to force a little break at the end so I can get everything back together accurately. So our next step is producing these molds. These molds help us produce casts or exact plastic replicas. And we're going to use those to fill in what we took out for our research. These bones also show fiberglass cradles and they really aid in positioning of the cast to get a really accurate fit when we put everything back together. We even need to account for that space we took out with the saw because the saw doesn't just if we break a bone, we don't have to worry as much about losing material, but the saw itself actually takes material away. So we account for that when we put it back. And then here I am very happy that these bones are going back together. Sometimes we'll leave it evident and we'll be able to, we'll put a little yellow code to let people know 100 years from now that this is a cast piece. It's hard to tell once we get um, our wonderful volunteers that I have in the lab who do the painting jobs for me now. They do a remarkable job. It looks just like new. But in this case, we wanted to leave the line evident so people could know this has been used for histology research. Other times, <laughs> we put it back together and we try to keep it less obvious. So this is a Triceratops. And if you could look at that carefully, um, there's a little clue I left you in the picture to try to figure out what part of that bone might not be real um, and might be a cast piece that's replaced. So I'll give you a minute to look at that. Okay. All right, so here's the answer. <laughs> we actually took the entire horn off and we took a segment of the horn out, replicated it, and then put everything back 
the way we found it, which is our goal when we do histology work. And we're known for that, and we've been known for that for many years at the Museum of the Rockies. So researchers from around the world trust us with their material, and we'll actually do um, produce thin section slides for them and do all of this processing. Okay, so we're back to how to. Now we're gonna zip down this line. So the bone itself is embedded into plastic resin. And I, um, I was gonna try, I, I made a, an attempt to embed this bone <laughs> um, and put it in an ice cube, but it, you couldn't see it once it was finished. So essentially we will take the bone, submerge it in a liquid plastic and then harden the plastic. So that'll show you the finished product. We'll cut thin wafers of the bone. So maybe be thinking, why do we put it in plastic? Um, why would we do that? I'll keep telling you the next steps. We then take those thin wafers and we mount them onto a glass slide. And then I spend many hours on this grinder using a special kind of grinding paper to grind the specimen down very thin. And then this is what I end up with. Many, many thin section slides. We know exactly where it came from. That's what all these notes and lines and <laughs> um, secret messages and codes are all around these slides. That lets us know exactly where it came from relative to the anatomy of the individual bone and the whole animal. And that really increases what we can say about um, the information we find on these slides as much data. I don't want us to lose any data as we go through the process. So we really try to maintain everything we have at the start through the whole, all of the steps. So any guesses on the embedding? Jamie, anybody jump in? Um, you said it's protective. It shows mm -hmm. what they look like in tiny parts. Okay. Uh, it's kind of like plastic or bubble wrap. It's harder to break that way. Very good. That's exactly right. That plastic around there, once it hardens, enables us to cut those thin wafers of bone and have them stay intact. So here's an interesting question. Here I am at the end of the process holding up a slide. Why might my fingers be taped? So that's something to think about, knowing what the process was. And sometimes I get to work and that's the first thing I do when I get there, <laughs> before I begin. So our Why? next step, oh, go ahead. <laughs> did you- for fingerprints, did... that's a good guess. Or so it doesn't mark oh. things up. Oh, interesting, okay to protect them from me, <laughs> right, right. Well, it's protecting me from that rough sandpaper that is on that grinder, because um, it's very, very sharp, sharp enough to grind through really, really hardened and very deeply mineralized uh, fossil material, but it's also really hard on the ends of the fingertips. And uh, many people joke that I probably don't have <laughs> the fingerprints I started with <laughs> when I started this position, because oftentimes I grind through that tape. With all that cold water, sometimes it's hard to know that you're actually um, have gotten down to your actual, to your skin. So generally I be um, careful, very careful about that now. So this is what you'll see under the microscope. I was showing you we do analysis. This is a special polarizing microscope and the stage here is, is uh, circular and you can actually rotate the specimen underneath and you'll go from that to that. So here's a question for you to think about. Once we are looking at bone underneath the microscope, this is the actual color of the fossil material then we can adjust some things on the microscope and get that, get this view. And all of these colors, in addition to being beautiful <laughs> and exquisite and amazing, are um, also providing us a lot of information about the different tissue types and the organization of the bone tissue within our specimen. So give some thought to color and I'm gonna forge ahead. Jamie, um, I might skip this uh, section, it's really heavy with a lot of terminology. Okay. 
Where are we at with time? About seven minutes. Okay. So um, really quickly, uh, I'm going to go through a whole series of slides talking about the outside to the inside of the bone and the terminology that we use in anatomy and histology. So I'll read some of these words to you. And um, as my dad, when he was sneaking me into his lab, telling me about his day and I didn't understand it, he said, the more you hear these words and see science working, um, the more familiar you'll become with it. So bone itself, these long bones that we we're talking about so far, start with a cartilage model and eventually develop into bone. So here's a picture of a baby dinosaur bone where you can see both cartilage and bone. So I was gonna ask you guys to say, give some thought to what part of this image, this is called a photomicrograph, a picture taken under the microscope, represents cartilage and which represents bone. And then here's the word, I put the word, most important words for you to catch in red, the diaphysis is the shaft of the bone. And when it comes to a long bone, that's the area that we're most interested in taking a sample from. It most um, evenly records the record of the animal's life laid down in the bony tissue. And now we're back to that group of Myasaura femora. It was the upper leg bone. And what's wonderful about these is they're really not only it's extraordinary to have all of these different stages of growth. They're really well intact. So we could measure all sorts of things about each of these bones as well as describe the histology. Now we're gonna go down another layer in and we're gonna look at, um, this would be the, what the bone would look like in three dimensions. And I like this because our thin section slides, our photomicrographs are two dimensions. But when you're looking at any of these structures, you have to remember that they, they're all three dimensional. From the osteons, these structures here, which are pretty much like straws or big lengths of licorice that have multi layers on the outside of each one. And these are primary building blocks of bone. They've got a vascular canal or a blood supply in the middle, bone tissue around the outside, and then cells organized also in a ring around that vascular canal, either depositing the bone or laying in wait until they get activated. So bone is very much a living tissue made up of substances from a number of different systems. Earlier, we talked about the respiratory system. We also have a circulatory system and a nervous system. So there's also blood supply and nerve in bone. So it is a combination of many different systems and collectively together is actually considered an organ. So the vascular canal is the blood supply in the center. And the lamellae is the term for those layers of bones, the concentric ring around that internal vascular canal. And the osteon was the full structure. So there it is again, just a quick look. And now, when you look at this slide, what do you see? <laughs> I'm still amazed, and I've been doing this quite a long time. <laughs> but right here in two dimensions, Hopefully this will now look familiar. That's an osteon. And there's our vascular canal. And this is inside of a Tyrannosaurus rex bone. One more layer in, we've got the actual cells. Osteoblasts are the cells that do the work of laying down the bony structure, the organic matrix of bone. We have osteocytes. Those are the ones walled in. <laughs> Once they've done their work as osteoblasts, they've surrounded themselves with bony tissue in all directions. So they lay in wait until they get uh, somewhat liberated as bone remodels. Um, it's constantly being deposited and eroded away. Um, through our entire lifetime. So then once those osteocytes are freed up again, um, then they can be available to deposit more bone. And then osteocyte lacunae, lacunae means little lake in Latin, and that's where they reside. 
So on back to this picture, every one of these dots is a lacunae. And inside of each of those lacunae, one individual bone cell resided. So when you study paleohistology, you can describe the tissue you see, but you can also, what we say, quantify. So describing what we see by tissue type would be um, describing uh, the quality of the tissue. Um, quantifying what we see would be counting or measuring. So we can actually count those osteocyte lacunae. Another very, very important feature of bone are these lines. And I'd like to hear some guesses from the group what those lines may be. We've got lines of rested growth. I'd like to hear what people think they represent and if they remind you of anything else that you've seen in nature. And I'll move ahead while we're looking at that. So we'll take this to the microscope. Again, we're back to that slide and back to the color. And if I could hear for a minute, if anybody has ideas about the lines. Oh, there were some great guesses. Okay, let's hear. Went away. Okay. Uh oh, okay. So pretty much between those lines, we, um, the area between those lines represents a year in the life of the dinosaur. And we can actually count those lines and get a, an approximate chronological age of the animal. So then again, we can figure out where it fits in into um, the population of dinosaurs that we're examining. How many minutes do we have, Jamie? Um, five to seven. Five to seven, okay. So we'll come back to this video if we have time. And that'll uh, tell you a little bit more about the colors. I'm gonna go through these and show you um, dinosaur bone growth underneath the microscope. And you can collect a lot of what I just talked about um, and see it actually happening before your eyes. We're gonna look at Mysora. So here we have a hatchling animal and we're looking at calcified cartilage and spicules of primary bone just beginning to form. And that's a close up. And then I'll move through these quickly. And how about you examine these and say, how are they changing over time? What are you seeing change in the bone? We have a nestling and then we have juvenile. So a subadult and then an adult. So I'll go through them again, just because it's really beautiful to see over time how bone changes and transforms and how we can look at this with paleohistology and understand so much more about our fossil specimen and the animals we're examining. We have a question okay. is if you've ever found bones without appetite or without cartilage. Found bones without appetite or without cartilage. The car I can speak to the cartilage. Um, the cartilage is a stage in long bones uh, when the bone is initially forming. So to be found in such a prevalent fashion, you'd have to have a hatchling animal um, and get it sort of right coming out of the egg and while it's still in the nest. And then as it, the animal grows and matures, that cartilage is gonna be replaced with primary bone. We also have um, articular cartilage at the ends of our bones um, where our joints meet and if you section instead of an across section fashion, if you do a longitudinal section of the ends of some dinosaur bones, you can still see preserved remnants of that articular cartilage at the end. And then there's also a unique um, other kind of cartilage called secondary cartilage, which can sometimes be found, um, and that's being actively researched. So uh, cartilage is usually, from what we know now, just in those 
those uh, a very set limited um, number of specimens. And then as far as appetite goes, you'd have to actually do a um, elemental analysis on your specimen to see how much original hydroxyapatite, calcium, phosphorus, oxygen, and hydrogen exists um, in your fossil specimen. And they are replaced with different minerals over time. And it actually can really vary in a fossil depending on the age and the, what kind of sedimentary environment it was in. Great, we have lots of questions about lags and lines of arrested development too. So. Perfect, okay, so these lags here, um, I don't know if anyone guessed at tree rings, but that's something that you can see out in nature. And um, they're uh, also the area between those two lines is representing a year in the life of a tree. So I wanted to just summarize one more time to think about how bone growth and change can tell us the ontogenetic stage of the animal. And once we know that age or stage, it can tell us where the fossil fits into the population of animals. And then, especially if we've got an adult of the animal, which many d dinosaurs were described based on adults, then we could figure out where it fits in the fossil record and place that into the geological record, knowing where our site location was. And essentially, combine all of this information and better understand ancient life on Earth. Um, let's see, I would love to go back, if we could, I'll sit at that video and I can answer some more questions. The what? While you're headed back, can you tell, if, tell okay. us if your job is fun? Is cutting dinosaur bones fun for you? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you might be able to tell from the slideshow. <laughs> it's that colorful and it's that fun. And it's, exci it's exciting scientifically because we're asking these really interesting questions and we're seeing if the bones can provide us um, the answers or the evidence we seek. Um, a lot of what's being understood now, now that we know that the skulls of these dinosaurs can transform so much um, as they mature, is to really understand when a fossil is found, is this an adult? Um, and if it's not, we need to, um, it's, it's, if it's not an adult, it's going to have a different set of features and we're going to ultimately understand those may transform in the next years of its life. So by knowing that we might have a juvenile or a sub-adult animal, we can um, not end up describing it as an entirely new fossil when it's a very familiar fossil, perhaps it's just not fully mature yet. Or if we do have that adult animal and we see that its skeleton's mature and it's at that apex of um, its its life and its formation, then we can look at other animals similar to it and figure out um, where it fits in the fossil record. So that part is super fun. And then you get to see, we get to work with like really great materials, <laughs> sort of a lot of things you get to work with when you're a kid in school, molding and casting, and then like great, uh, exciting equipment like tile saws and grinders, and then of course the microscope, which I've loved since day one. Um, and then my colleagues, my colleagues are phenomenal. Um, we've got this amazing crew of people, um, and a lot of people have come in from different avenues um, and different passions. So we all add together really um, well because we're bringing different things to the picture, and we get to travel as in paleontology, go to different scientific meetings. I get to do trainings and workshops all around the world to train people how to do paleoestology. So I feel very honored to be, to be an integral part of this part of, of the field. Awesome, thanks for sharing more about your unique job. I do have a unique job, very fun. <laughs> and it's only two blocks away <laughs> from where I am right now. <laughs> so I look forward to getting back into the basement. All right, let's see your works of art before we go. 
So this is a wonderful description um, about how we get all those colors. They roamed the earth millions of years ago. But you don't have to rent a movie to see them again. Paleohistologist Ellen Therese Lamb uses a microscope to study fossils, but her images are not like this. They're more like this. People look at them and they often want to know what is that, and they can't believe that it's a dinosaur. The images are microscopic views of dinosaur bones. Lamb saws off a slice of bone from a dinosaur. The slice is so thin, light shines right through it under a microscope. What started out as this can turn out like this. With fossil material, we can see the arrangement of the crystals, and that's what creates the remarkable colors. The unique colors are the result of polarized light. Light waves move in all directions, but a polarizer filters out waves moving in the same direction. After the waves pass through the fossil slice, an analyzer collects them. The image is a distinct pattern of light wavelengths, but pretty images aren't the only thing researchers see. We can see the age and stage of growth and development. We can get an indication of the health of the animal. This image won an honorable mention award in the Olympus Bioscapes Digital Imaging Competition for microscopic images of science subjects. There's plenty more where this one came from. I will be keeping my eye out for more potential award winners. Having a real eye for the art of science. I'm Alex Kane reporting. Excellent. All right. Ellen, we go. <laughs> everyone, a round of applause to Ellen from our homes today. Thank you, Ellen, for joining us. <laughs> and that pretty much sums up our live stream series for this school year. Awesome. There's one last question we can answer in about one minute. One minute. Okay, I'll shoot. And then I put this quote on the bottom, let's keep science a part of everyday life. <laughs> Ad living from Rosalind Franklin. And thank you, Dakota, for sh sharing that quote with me. I think that is a pretty fantastic note to end on. Keep okay. science a part of your everyday life. Thank yeah. you, Ellen. Okay, everyone. Thank Enjoy you. your summer, keep learning, keep asking questions, and come visit us at the Museum of the Rockies. We open to the public next Wednesday the 3rd. All right, have a great one.